Okay. Sorry. Uh, sorry for the delay. Just trying to get a few things set up here and realizing that because today is pretend Monday, the normally normally scheduled Zoom link uh, for the Monday class wasn't there, and I didn't know that, so we had to improvise. Folks at home, probably those of you who are here figured out how to click the link for tomorrow's noon lecture, so hopefully we'll be okay. And uh, am I muted? People at home, you can hear me okay? Just say something if you can't in the chat. Yeah, thumbs up. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. So we've been talking in antiomers, diastereomers, and... Um, is something chiral or not. Recall our definition of an enantiomer is a molecule that is not, the, or a chiral molecule is not the same as its mirror image. Two mirror image molecules that are not the same are called enantiomers, and then every other kind of stereoisomer is called a diastereomer. Now last time I believe I showed you some of my evil tricks for concealing chiral compounds. Classic ways to test your knowledge of stereochemistry are first, is it chiral or not? Um, a or B, flip a coin, and you got a 50-50 shot. So maybe actually not that great of a question. But on the other hand, I will deceive 25 to 33% of you using these tricks. And the, the classic example is the non-chiral molecule that looks chiral because I've drawn it in a shape where its non-chirality isn't obvious. Um, so if I were to draw a molecule like this uh, and you were to draw its mirror image, you might be tempted to conclude that those two are enantiomers of each other. However, uh, you would to to escape this uh, trap. You would either need to be good at visualizing and moving molecules around in 3D, or um, no, that's pretty much it. Visualizing <laughs> molecules and moving them around in 3D. There's two ways you can see this. The first is our friend the pancake flip. So here's our molecular spatula. We're gonna slide that thing under the molecule and then we're going to flip it pancake style. Uh, and when we do, let's see, I will draw the result. Flip that molecule over, we get this. Do you see how this OH group, which was down, pointing down and away from us, now is pointing up and toward us because we flipped the molecule over. That's confusing. All it means is you need a little bit of practice with a model set to, to convince yourself that this is true. And then, oh, look, they are the same thing. Exactly the same thing. The other way that you can escape this trap is uh, to Notice that the two central carbons here are each attached to the same kinds of things. Uh, for our discussion, maybe we'll call this carbon two and carbon three. I notice that two is attached to an oxygen and so is three. Two is attached to a methyl group and so is three. And then two and three are each attached to carbons that are attached to methyl groups and OH groups. So it looks like they maybe could be attached to exactly the same things. Uh, to compare them, it will be, and to see whether there's a hidden <clears throat> plane of symmetry that might let us know that this molecule is not chiral, we can simply rotate around this carbon-carbon bond by, I think, about 180 degrees so that the methyl groups on both carbons two and three are lined up with each other in the plane of the page. When we do that, the OH group, which was pointing away from us on carbon three should now be pointing towards us. Uh, hopefully you can see how if we did the same thing over here, we would end up with a similar picture 
And now it becomes even more obvious that these two are the same thing. And it's clear uh, as well that the compound itself is not chiral because we have a plane of symmetry, mirror plane of symmetry, of course, and that's present in both of those. So those two are not enantiomers, even though it looks like they are enantiomers, they are the same not chiral meso compound, all right? Now, we, we did that last time as a demonstration of the fact that if you have two stereocenters or more, you might be chiral, but you might not. So beware of hidden secret achiral molecules, right? Um, question you want to ask about that? Is it possible to draw a plane of symmetry on the first molecule from someone in the chat? Um, looking at it, no, I'm not seeing if I were to draw a plane of sim if I were to try to draw a plane of symmetry down the middle, what's on the left of it would be not a reflection of what's on the right of it. So, so that's not a plane of symmetry. But that gives us a chance to illustrate an important point. Um, a molecule that is not chiral in uh, one conformation is not chiral in all conformations. That's why we rotated around that carbon-carbon bond so that we could see um, the plane of symmetry. Now I have to put an asterisk uh, on that statement, a molecule that is not chiral in one conformation is not chiral in all conformations. Uh, and the fine print down here is provided that interchange between conformations is fast at, root, at whatever temperature you're at. Uh, it won't be an issue in this class, but were you to go on in organic chemistry, you would see that there are a few cases where molecules, uh, where two different shapes of the same molecule are enantiomers of each other because you can't interchange rapidly between those shapes. It's a minor point and we won't, uh, we won't, we won't go there, but I did add the asterisk so that I could feel good uh, about technically oversimplifying. All right, uh, I saw a hand here in the front. Yeah. Question, yeah. What was a, a meso compound again? Right, um, so a meso compound means a molecule that is not chiral, but has stereocenters. Uh, and it is not chiral because it is the same as its mirror image. Or in other words, it does not have an enantiomer. So uh, someone uh, from home asked, is a meso compound then any compound that is not chiral? The answer is no. A meso compound looks like it could be chiral because it has stereocenters. And therein is the difference. Right, methane is not chiral, but it is also not a meso compound because methane has no stereocenters. Yeah. Yeah. Do all meso compounds have at least two? Yes, stereocenters. Yeah. If you have just one stereocenter, you must be chiral. If you have two or more, you might be chiral, but beware of the insidious meso compound. Yeah. Are there different conformations of that molecule that they draw? Like, if we change the methyl and the OH group, like the size of the 
Yeah, so are there other conformations besides these two that we could draw for, for sure? And if we looked down this carbon-carbon bond, we would see three possible staggered conformations. Uh, and the, the key is that if you can find a plane of symmetry in one of those shapes, then the molecule is not chiral even if the plane of symmetry isn't obvious in other conformations. I think we could, so when looking for enantiomers, are you allowed to rotate around the carbon-carbon bond? Yes, because rotation around carbon-carbon sigma bonds is fast at room temperature. So um, as long as you've got a, got a plane of symmetry in one conformation, you'll have it in, uh, it counts as though it were present in all of the conformations. To illustrate that point, maybe we'll go ahead and draw the Newman projection down this molecule. Uh, I'm doing this because actually drawing the Newman projection is, a, is another evil way of concealing meso compounds and making it difficult for you to tell whether two molecules are enantiomers or not. So uh, it, when viewed from the perspective of our little eye there, I spy with my little eye, um, the OH would be coming out at our right uh, and the proton would be coming out to our left. In front is carbon two, carbon three is in the back. The methyl group is pointing up. Let's see, the OH would be pointing to our left and the proton would be pointing to our right. So that's one of the possible staggered conformations. And if we keep the carbon three in the back in the same orientation, but just rotate that carbon in the front, we can cycle through the two other staggered conformations. And uh, if you look at them all, it's difficult to tell whether, oh, sorry. If you look at them all, it's very difficult to see a plane of symmetry uh, at all. So those are the three staggered conformations. No, yes, still no. Did I do something wrong? I did something wrong here, didn't I? Yep, hold on. That better? Got it, okay. So um, in none of these conformations is it absolutely clear that there's a plane of symmetry, right? In fact, seeing the plane of symmetry actually requires you to look at the eclipsed conformation that is somewhere in between uh, staggered two and staggered three. That would be where the methyl group in the back lines up with the methyl group in the front, where the OH in the front lines up with the OH in the back, and the proton in the front lines up with the proton in the back. If you see an eclipsed conformation of this kind, where groups in the front are eclipsed with their identical counterparts in the back, then the plane of symmetry is the page that uh, bisects the line between carbons two and three. So sometimes you have to search a little bit through the possible conformations in order to find that a molecule is um, not chiral. All right. Yes.
So, so the question uh, here in class is, if you're looking at a Newman projection, um, is it a good idea to try to draw one of the eclipse confirmations and see if you can detect a plane of symmetry like this? The answer is yes. Um, it would be possible, of course, there might be molecules where even if you do that, there is no plane of symmetry. Um, so an example of that would be, what if I take this same molecule, but I switch the stereochemical configuration of the carbon in the front such that the proton is over here and the OH group is over there, right? I could, I could cycle through all possible eclipsed conformations there and I would never in a gazillion years be able to get all three to line up like they did up, up, uh, up here. Would that be the an enantiomer? Uh, an someone asked here in class, would that be an enantiomer? An enantiomer of what? With the other of this one? No. Uh, no, actually, uh, the molecule that we've started class with is this one is the same as these, which is the same as all of these. Uh, so I suppose if, if you can see that, um, this molecule has the plane of symmetry and the plane of symmetry means it isn't chiral and it cannot be. All right. When a molecule has a plane of symmetry, it's really kind of uh, cool because what it means, I'm going to use pink for the plane of symmetry. Uh, you can move that plane of symmetry and uh, turn it into a mirror and suddenly the molecule is the same as its mirror image. So if you have a plane of symmetry, a molecule is automatically the same as its mirror image and is automatically not chiral. Um, now, so someone at home, let's see, Kyle, you're saying the one down here would be a diastereomer of the one up here highlighted in gray. Yes, and I could ask that and have done before. What is the relationship between these two compounds and uh, are they enantiomers, are they diastereomers, or are they the same compound? <clears throat> and if you look at these two Newman projections, the stereo center in the back is exactly the same. All the groups are in the same places, but the stereo center in the front is the one we've switched. And this leads to a useful rule of thumb. Diastereomers have uh, different stereochemical configuration. That means which groups are up versus down at at least one, but not all stereocenters. So because we've just switched the configuration of the stereo center in the front, the, the, car, the OH group used to be pointing to our left. Now it's pointing to our right when the methyl group is in the same spot. Yes, these two are diastereomers. Now, if that's difficult to see, I recommend converting from the Newman projection into the side-by-side -side drawing, okay? So to do this, you simply have to... Um, put your eye back in the plane of the page, look down the bond, be or look directly at the bond between carbons two and three. From this perspective, methyl groups would be here, uh, and then OH groups would be coming out at you. Again, from this perspective, the plane of symmetry is much easier to detect. If we did the same thing with our drawing here, 
um, looking down, uh, looking directly uh, at the bond between two and three, again, methyl groups would be pointing upward. On carbon two, the OH group would be pointing away from us. Oh dear, I, I think I'm actually getting my left and my right mixed up with each other, aren't I? Turns out not to matter <laughs> with uh, the meso compound. Let's see, the way we're looking at it, two is here, three is there, two is there, three is there. Uh, on carbon two, the OH group would be pointing away from us, and on carbon three, it would be pointing toward us when viewed from that side, okay? Uh, and now it becomes clearer that there is no plane of symmetry for this molecule. Right, because what's on the left is not a reflection of what's on the right. They're actually opposite in configuration. OH is up versus down. So, is the molecule we've drawn here chiral? Yes. How do you know? It's got stereo centers, and there's no plane of symmetry, so it's got to be chiral. Alternatively, you could draw the mirror image and convince yourself that it's not the same. And uh, we can do that here. Over here on the right is the mirror image of what we drew on the left. And uh, it doesn't matter how many times we flip this molecule over, we can line up the methyl groups, but not the OH groups. And so, and it may be difficult to convince yourself that that's the case. Again, if that's true, then uh, you need a little bit of practice with some uh, molecular models. Uh, but these two then are enantiomers and both are chiral. This one is chiral, this is chiral. The meso compound above is not chiral, though it is a diastereomer of both of the molecules below. So, uh, yeah, Jessica from home notes that we have three stereoisomers possible in this molecule, one meso compound and two enantiomers, and both enantiomers are diastereomers of the meso compound above. All right. So, now you know that trick. Uh, there's not that many ways to iterate on it. I, of course, am going to change things so that the methyl groups aren't methyl groups and the OH groups aren't OH groups. But basically, there's only one problem here. It's can you visualize the molecule well enough to identify whether or not it's chiral? All right. What, uh, what other questions? Okay, um, I'll just point out briefly uh, that when trying to figure out if a molecule that has a cyclohexane ring in it is chiral or not, it can be difficult to see when viewed from the chair conformation. Uh, but when viewed from above, it becomes absolutely clear that this molecule is a meso compound that is not chiral because of the plane of symmetry running through the molecule. Um, if you were to draw the mirror image of this molecule, you might be temporarily convinced that the molecule was not the same as its mirror image, but it can become the same as its mirror image uh, through chair flipping.
Now, uh, I don't really want to spend any time trying to convince you that these two are mirror images of each other. The, the take home message is when thinking about stereochemistry, view the six membered ring from above and the relationships will be clearer. Yeah. Yes, are you able to say that both of those methyl groups are up even though one is equatorial and one is axial? Yes. All right. And this is an, another illustration of the same principle. If a molecule has a plane of symmetry, or has, is symmetrical in one conformation, it counts as though it were present in all conformations. Yeah. Yes, you could convert that not chiral meso compound into a chiral compound by switching the stereochemical configuration of one of the stereocenters. Now this molecule is chiral and it has an enantiomer. You can draw that enantiomer either by drawing the mirror image or, and these three lines mean what I'm about to draw is exactly the same as what I've drawn above, you can simply draw the molecule in the same orientation but switch stereochemistry at each and every stereocenter. So these two molecules are uh, enantiomers of each other. And then these two and these two are diastereomers of each other. So again, illustration of the principle enantiomers are chiral. They're mirror images of each other. They're not the same. And they have opposite configuration at each and every stereocenter. In contrast, diastereomers have opposite stereochemical configuration at at least one stereocenter, but not all of them. Yeah. So the two on the right, the top two on the right, those are not diastereomers? Yeah, the top two on the right are not diastereomers, they are enantiomers. Okay. Um, so it might be useful now to introduce a brief uh, a tool that we can use to um, facilitate our discussion of stereochemistry because sometimes it's not totally clear whether when comparing two different stereoisomers whether we've really switched configuration at, at a stereocenter. And in any case, we want some kind of term in order to describe how the stereocenter, say, for carbon-2 in the enantiomer on the left differs from the stereocenter uh, in the diastereomer, as an example. We want a way of talking about the configuration of stereocenters that doesn't depend on up versus down, uh, because those are relative terms. So that allows a, so so the concept we're going for is called absolute stereochemical configuration and we're going to determine that absolute stereochemical configuration and we're going to name it with a letter r or s and i think those come from the latin for left versus right maybe um, and I think R is right and S is left. Um, in any case, these are going to be uh, analogous to E and Z in that we are going to use E and Z priority rules in our process for describing a stereocenter as R or S. So uh, let's actually start with that uh, lovely meso compound that we just drew. And it may help us to enlarge the image a little. Nope, doesn't want us to, that's okay. Ha ha, I win. Um, we'll enlarge the image a little bit and we'll start uh, with carbon. It will maybe be helpful to call this carbon A and carbon B. So uh, starting with carbon A, 
if, if you have a stereo center that is an SP3 hybridized carbon uh, attached to four different things, uh, it's useful to draw all four of the things. So if one of them is a proton and is implied, you should draw it in. In this case, the proton is going back away from us. Uh, and the methyl group is coming back toward us. Now, we've got four groups attached to carbon A. We need to rank them from one to four in order of atomic weight. It's an atom by atom comparison, just as we did for E and Z. So hydrogen being the lightest is automatically the lowest priority group. And that's important because uh, that, that's the one we're basically going to ignore. Then we need to rank the other three. So uh, as we compare the other three things that are attached to carbon A, carbon, carbon, and carbon, it's a tie. So we go through our tiebreaker procedure. The methyl group is, of course, bound to one carbon and three hydrogens. The CH2 group is bonded to two carbons and two hydrogens. And uh, carbon B is bonded to three carbons and a hydrogen. So we're going to go down the list until we find a difference. And uh, the first difference we find doesn't happen after the first round of comparison, but the second, carbon beats hydrogen, so this group has rank three. And then we compare the last two standing, uh, and in the final round, carbon beats hydrogen, so the CH2 group has rank two, and carbon B has rank one. See how we did that? That's just exactly like our E and Z procedure. So if you struggled with that on the last exam, you are going to struggle with R and S on this exam unless you fix it. The nice part is it's, it's straightforward to fix if you can follow the procedure. Once we've identified groups 1, 2, and 3, we draw an, an arrow, but not that way. <laughs> we draw an arrow from 1 to 2 from two to three and from three back to one. And we note the sense of that circle and the arrows that we drew. Are they going clockwise or counterclockwise? In this case, it is clockwise. Now, uh, when that circle is clockwise and priority four group is down, we're going to say that the stereo center has R configuration. All right. If uh, the priority four group was inadvertently up, clockwise would mean S. So again, because we go from one to two, two to three, and three back to one, and that is a clockwise rotation, and because the lowest priority group proton is down, then the stereochemical configuration is R. All right. Any questions about that process? Go ahead. Um, why do we not include the four or do we do we include the four at all? Or, no, we ignore the four. Yeah, in the process of drawing the circle, it's only between one, two, and three. The only reason that four matters is whether it's pointing up at us or back away from us. So did you say that if four is up, it's not R and it's S, even though it's clockwise still? That's right. So if, if four is not back away from you, if instead it is up, it should be S. And the reason for this has to do with, I mean, eh, uh, if you look at the Earth from the North Pole, and you see it's rotating in one direction. I'm not sure which direction that is, but if you look at from the South Pole, it's rotating in the other direction. So try to, I mean, this is like patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time, but draw, have a circular clockwise motion and then keep going the same way, but put yourself under that and oh my gosh, it just turned counterclockwise, right? Um, even though we're rotating the same direction. So, 
So that's, that's behind the principle that it matters which direction we're looking at these groups. And if proton is back away from us, clockwise means R. If it's in front of us, clockwise means the opposite of what it normally means, which is S. Yeah? Um, so is there counterclockwise in it? Is there counterclockwise? Yeah, if it were counterclockwise and proton was back, the stereochemical configuration would be S. So let me illustrate that. And there's a question from home. Is, um, is the whole molecule R? No, only the stereo center we were investigating is R. Okay. So we'll do this same thing, not only for stereo center A, but also for stereo center B. So we'll just erase all the other junk we put on there. Da, da, da. Oops, too much. All right, stereo center B. <clears throat> Again, we'll put the proton here. We ask about the four groups that are attached to stereo center B. Uh, three are carbon, one is hydrogen. Hydrogen loses and is priority four. So then we compare the remaining three groups. And uh, again, for the same reasons we described above, <clears throat> we'll say that uh, A is priority one, CH2 is priority two, and methyl is priority three. Arrow from one to two, two to three, and three back to one. That is counterclockwise and priority four group proton is down. So the configuration is S. <clears throat> so if we were to name this molecule uh, and name it as distinct from the other diastereomer, we would have R and S in the name, right? This would be 1R, 2S, 1, 2, dimethyl cyclohexane. And yes, uh, Annie from home asks, is it the same as E and Z where if they tie completely then you can't assign R versus S? Yes, absolutely. Um, all right, so questions about assigning R versus S, go ahead. If they tie completely, what does that mean that it's not a stereocenter? That's right, if they tie completely, then if, two, if, if groups on that proposed stereocenter tie completely, then, they're not actually, then it's not actually a stereocenter because it's attached to two of the same thing. Good, good point. Um, you use E and Z only for double bond configuration. You use R and S for stereocenters. Um, so notice now, if we were to go back up, um, or actually I'll just maybe redraw them down here. Uh, the other diastereomer, that is the one where the other two diastereomers, uh, where the methyl groups are trans to each other. Um, if we were to assign stereochemistry uh, analogously down here, uh, you would see that the stereo center on carbon two, instead of being S, is actually R. And the way that we explain this is when comparing the three things attached, we assign priority like we've always done. I suppose A and B is how we want to keep things. One, two, three, one to two, two to three, three back to one. It is counterclockwise, but proton, the lowest priority group, is up. For counterclockwise, we normally would have said S, but when proton is up, counterclockwise is actually R. Now, some people will tell you that instead of doing it this way, you redraw the molecule such that proton is pointing away from you and then you assign stereochemistry. You can do that and it's fine, it's just more involved and you run the risk of drawing the molecule incorrectly when you flip it over. So in my mind it's easier 
to memorize that when proton is back, clockwise is R and counterclockwise is S. And then if proton is up, you got to switch. Okay, so I, I always tell myself when I'm assigning stereo centers, I was, okay, it's counterclockwise, but proton is up or proton is down, therefore, and then I'll assign R versus S. And that way you don't have to redraw things. Um, the other enantiomer, if we assign stereochemistry, would be the SS molecule. Um, all right. So now you can see uh, that the diastereomer we drew above, the cis diastereomer, where the methyl groups are cis to each other, has RS configuration. Whereas the two that are enantiomers of each other are RR and SS respectively. This is one way you can tell whether things are enantiomers versus diastereomers. Notice for the pair of enantiomers, they have opposite configuration at each and every stereocenter. Whereas for the pairs that are diastereomers, they're different at one, but not both. And that uh, in that way, the R and the S can be a useful tool. Um, okay, so there's a few uh, questions in the chat about uh, whether certain situations can be stereo centers and how do you deal with lone pairs. Um, first of all, for the most part, you don't. <laughs> um, so someone has asked about an oxygen is that a stereo center? No, the two oxygens are attached. The oxygen is attached to only two different things. The lone pairs don't count as different things here. And even if they did, they're the same as each other. So not a stereo center. An interesting question is a nitrogen with a lone pair on it attached to three different things. Is that a stereo center? And the answer is it depends. <laughs> That's not a good one, and so I'm not going to be asking you to assign stereochemistry of nitrogens. Uh, the nitrogen here is uh, trigonal pyramidal, and you could almost assign stereochemical configuration if you called the lone pair the lowest priority group. But nitrogens are known to invert easily and quickly at room temperature. Uh, it's very fast for the nitrogen to uh, temporarily rehybridize, uh, I guess I should do something like that. And now it's very easy for the nitrogen to, to rehybridize and invert uh, such that it converts from one configuration to the other. Um, so this process is called inversion. It is fast for nitrogens. And therefore, for our purposes, nitrogens attached to three different things are not stereocenters. Okay. Yeah. If there were multiple stereocenters, like say there were like three or four stereocenters, would it Right. If the, the question is, if a molecule had multiple stereocenters, in order to have an enantiomer, would each and every one need to be opposite? And the answer is yes. Okay. Um, so there's a lot to practice here. And honestly, um, you're going to need to do it yourself. You're going to need to uh, encounter your own misconceptions and mistakes and stub your toes a couple of times. Uh, Pay attention to why you're getting things wrong. Uh, with R and S, because it's just a 50-50 thing, it's easy to be right for the wrong reason. So especially interrogate uh, times where you get something wrong and discover a problem in your process and fix it, okay? Because any flaw in your process that remains uh, is, gonna, is gonna trip you up later. Um, and Kyle, to be a stereo center, you need to have four different things bonded to it, never th just three, and that's right. Um, 
yeah. So I want to tell you a brief story about um, a molecule that uh, was released in 1998 as an inhibitor of proton pumps in your stomach, and it was used as uh, an, ant an antacid uh, to treat heartburn, and actually is still used today. Um, it's called uh, Prilosec or Omeprazole. Um, and interestingly, and you're just gonna have to take my word for it on this one, there's a lone pair on that sulfur that uh, sulfurs invert slowly. So this sulfur counts as a stereocenter, though I promise you that I will not ask you to call that sulfur a stereocenter, nor will I ask you to determine its configuration. It's just important for the, for the story. Okay, so this molecule is a chiral molecule. It has one stereocenter. Um, stereocenters are challenging to make in their pure configuration. That is, it is challenging to make one enantiomer instead of another. Um, in chemistry, there is no ex nihilo chirality, meaning it doesn't come from nothing. You either get a stereocenter from existing stereocenters or you use existing stereocenters to bias your synthesis process for one stereocenter versus another. None of that makes sense now because we haven't done any reactions yet. It will uh, make some sense in the future. But when they first made this molecule, they uh, marketed it as a one-to-one -one mixture of uh, this stereoisomer and its enantiomer. Um, a one-to-one -one mixture of enantiomers is called a racemate or a racemic mixture. And sometimes we will use the symbol plus and minus in parentheses by a molecule to indicate that both stereoisomers are present. So often when I want to draw two stereoisomers, uh, two enantiomers, instead of drawing both of them, I'll just draw one with a plus or minus. So this, this molecule was marketed under the trade name Prilosec, uh, the, and, and its generic name was Omeprazole. And um, when molecules first are approved by the FDA, the FDA gives the company that makes them a certain amount of time on their patent in order to recoup all of their R&D costs, and they can sell that molecule exclusively. But for each and every drug, there's a time limit. It's called the patent cliff. And once you pass that, other companies can make the drug. And this is a disaster for drug companies. When Pfizer uh, lost uh, exclusive rights to Lipitor, their revenue went down by billions of dollars. So there's a strategy they use, and we'll talk about it next time. I think I'll just delay study guide five until probably Thursday, because we didn't quite finish today. We'll finish five in the next a uh, couple minutes of tomorrow's lecture and move on to chapter six. See you then.